How can we stop Russia? First, manpower. You need to be in position to kill more Russians than they can recruit and regenerate. We are not putting enough money on the table, we are not manufacturing enough ammunition, and we are not doing enough. That's the problem. It's doable, affordable, it's within the reach. Do you feel like NATO allies would be willing to come defend if, if a Soviet of Finland, for example, invoked Article 5? Okay, that's a good question. They will do it again and again and again. I think our generational job to make this madness end. Welcome to Shoot Talk. Kustisal knows exactly what Ukraine needs to drive the Russian invaders out of their country. Which is why I wanted to meet and talk about this during the Munich Security Conference of 2024. We had a great discussion about Ukraine, NATO, Russia and military aid. Hope you enjoy it. So, uh... Could you briefly introduce yourself, who you are, what do you do, what is your favorite soup? Yes, I can. Well, first of all, thank you, Becca, for inviting us here. And, uh, and first of all, I need to congratulate for your own soup that you make from the ingredients of the little uh, particles of the Russian propagandists. So I'm a really avid reader and, and really enjoy what you're doing. Thank you. But I think when it comes to culinary discipline, then... Um, I think for us, for everyone, the uh, childhood memories uh, when you came out, of, you know, from gold one day, and your mother prepared the soup that was uh, with all the usual ingredients and the most, uh, and then the best ones, the uh, care and all the love that they put into that. And this is something that uh, still makes you feel good. Agree with that, yeah. And I'm I'm Gusti I'm the permanent secretary in Estonia Ministry of Defense. So, and that's what I do as a daily chart. Okay. You are from Estonia. Can you describe Estonia in three adjectives? Yeah, well, let me think. Uh, small, poor, and invisible. <laughs> okay. And, and of course, there's a fourth one, and, and I think we joined with Finns a uh, pretty healthy sense of humor, especially when it comes to mocking, mocking ourselves. I uh, agree with that, yeah. Um, okay, then a, si- a serious question. What needs to happen in order for the Dallas Mavericks to win another championship? I mean, it was 2011 uh, the last time. Yeah. Well, they, they, they need to do something serious with their front court. Okay. <laughs> Maybe by Lauri Markkanen from... Well, that, that might help, certainly. <laughs> All right. Um, but your, your title is uh, Permanent Secretary of the Estonian Ministry of Defense. What does it mean? Uh, were you elected? Uh, is it a forever position like Lukashenko and Putin or how does it work? Oh, that's a tough one. Lukashenko and Putin. Well, there, there's got to be some difference. Huh? <laughs> Hopefully, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, I, 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 I'm not a war criminal, for example. Um, well, I have a boss. Uh, my boss is Defense Minister. So, um, and unlike Putin, I, I can be sacked, so not tomorrow morning. Well, I, he has, hasn't, hasn't sacked me yet, and I hope he doesn't sack me after this interview. <laughs> but permanent secretary is the top civil, civil servant job in the Ministry of Defense. So I oversee everything that uh, Estonia does in defense when it comes to capability developments, but also the defense policy and the international agenda. And, and of course, the top item there is uh, for Ukraine to win the war. Okay, um, but whenever any of the big news media need a level-headed commentary on, on the war in Ukraine, they usually call you or contact you. Why do you think that is? Well, for that question, um, we need to go back to 1210. Well, I, I actually I don't want to go to that, uh, that road we all know <laughs> where this one goes. Well, I mean, sometimes there are questions that answer themselves. Uh, for us, the war in Ukraine is existential. Uh, this is something where uh, what puts our livelihood at stake, and this is clearly where we cannot afford being pocket philosophers or speaking about ourselves in the third sense or depicting this like I don't know the the unreleased sixth sixth season of House of Cards or something. That's a real world happening in front of our eyes, and it's our duty to make this madness stop. Talking about madness, today it was actually announced that Russian opposition figure Alexei Navalny has died in Russia. Uh, any thoughts on this or on, on Russian opposition in general? Or is, if, is there a Russian opposition? That is another example in the big pile of examples that uh, is yet convincing us that we are facing a murderer. We are facing someone who is not hesitated about anything. 
Um, what we also need to pay attention of the uh, date. This is 17 years after Putin's famous speech in, in the same town in Munich. Um, and he's not going to stop before he's, he's going to be stopped. That's, I think, the message that we need to read out from that. Do you think that the announcement of his death on, on, on during the Munich Security Conference is it a con coincidence or is it like pre-planned? I don't know. I mean, we don't really pay too much attention to that. But I'm mean, just the, if things happen in the same place, same time, and well, in broad sense, saving, serving the same purpose, then we don't really look any further. I guess. Um, <clears throat> okay. Simple question: How can we stop Russia? Well, it's fairly simple. Um, I mean, at, at least in terms of uh, articulating this. Russia needs to be kicked out of Ukraine. Uh, Ukraine needs to win the war. Um, and they not only territorially need to win the war, but Russia needs to walk away with understanding that in 2024, in the 21st century, you don't go occupy other countries. You don't suppress the self-expression right, self-fulfillment right of other nations, other people. You don't murder, you don't kill, you don't rape. You don't uh, block the aspirations of other nations. You don't uh, dictate the wor world ac according to, to the spheres of influences. You don't bully other nations. And, and that's fairly simple. And it's not only the, the sticking to the rules or, or the international law. It's, it's also sticking to the common sense. Because if we allow this to happen this time, they will do it again and again and again. And it will be open door policy for all the present and future murderers, autocrats, dictators in the world. So it's, I think, our generational job to make this madness end. We are seeing Russian missile production ramping up quickly. Can you speak more about this and what and how Ukraine needs to respond to this? Yeah, gladly, gladly, gladly. Uh, see, this is the, uh, I brought this in purpose. Just a few weeks ago, we uh, published a strategy that sets the pathway for Ukraine to win the war. Well, what's ongoing there is attrition warfare. And attrition, attrition warfare is not something that was invented in Ukraine. It's, it's something that has been has, has gone hand in hand in military warfare history for years or for centuries. So, and it basically gets down to three avenues where you need to be better than the Russians. First, manpower. And the calculation there is extremely simple. You need to be in position to kill more Russians than they can recruit and regenerate. Well, the good thing is that the Ukrainians since the early February have been doing that. And the number, and this is what we present here, you can look into the, the, the exact math maths of that. So every six months they need to kill uh, more than 40,000. So preferable 50, 60,000 in six months. Because with that we implant into the Russians' heads that Every day, every week, every month, every year, you have less manpower than you had before. And mathematically, this trend will end up in zero. And if you get this idea in your head, then, well, guess what? You might have an idea that why don't we maybe stop this? The second one is um, resources. What's ongoing in Ukraine is fire superiority war. And in order to win fire superiority war, you need what? Ammunition? No, least, exactly. You need fire superiority and <laughs> ammunition. <laughs> that's, uh, that's fairly simple. So again, <clears throat> we have made calculations, uh, and the rate of ammunition that Ukraine needs is around 200,000 shells a month. And we are in the road to get there. Of course, to Ukraine appetite, to our appetite, I think to the appetite of most of the of your viewers is, is too late and it's too little, but we are moving towards that direction. In 2021, the, uh, the manufacturing ability of European allies was around 300,000 shells a year. And roughly the same was in the US. So uh, Europe and US are basically going lockstep on that issue. Um, by the end of this quarter, uh, so it means in the matter of one or two months, um, we in Europe get to the manufacturing rate of one million rounds a year. Now, by the end of this year, we get to the rate of around 1.3, 1.4, which means that compared to 21, it's already been fourfolded. And uh, if uh, you know, all the contracts will be in place and all the plans materialized, then by 25, European uh, contribution will be around 2 million. 
And the US is going, well, basically on the same pace. So by 25, we will have this advantage. So Ukrainians can demolish more Russian troops, more Russian artillery, more Russian command posts, more logistics roads and all that. So they will get to the advantage that, uh, again, Russians start to understand that every single month they will have less equipment, less weapons, less whatever ability to maneuver, less ability to impose their will. Um, and of course, if this idea gets to their head, then maybe they will give up at some point. And third one is, um, well, the simplest one, is uh, the willingness. Willingness of Ukrainians and also willingness of, uh, of the West. And uh, we have been very liberal in handing out all promises that as long as it takes and all that. Well, we need to be more precise. It also needs to be as much as it takes and whatever it takes. Again, <clears throat> if you are more interested, then reach out to this brochure. Uh, there are exact mathematics here. Um, the calculation is very easy. And again, this is something that the Ramstein coalition, the 51 nations around the world, the, the nations who have been supporting Ukraine, uh, what we have done for 24 months so far, uh, we need to keep on investing 0.25% of GDP uh, to Ukrainian military aid. Well, now, 0.25% uh, uh, is something that, and we realize it very well, there is no normal people who would operate with this term in their you know, daily, daily lives. But the message that it gives to you is that, well, 0, 25, it sounds like a small number, doesn't it? It's one out of 400. What time is it now? It's uh, three o'clock? Let me check, something like that. Yeah. Uh -huh. So today is 16th of February. By three o'clock this year, 2024, Contribution is done for everyone. And we can move on for, with all the other topics that uh, we deal with our daily lives. So it's more. We can all afford it. We can get there. It's, it's, it's not an over-human Herculean task or something. It is something that we can afford and something that uh, makes our lives better, safer, more prosperous, and will uh, give the Ukrainians the opportunity that they deserve so much. So that's the sort of main point of... of of this strategy, and if we keep on and commit to this, then we will get to this uh, uh, much awaited victory. Okay. That was a long answer, sorry. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, it was a good answer. It's not a paid promotion, by the way. We didn't pay. Yeah. It's, a, it's a very good paper. I've read it, and it's, it's, I think it's the, probably, in my view, it's the best plan that I've, it's because it, it's concrete, it's, uh, it, it shows the numbers that are needed, and it's, it's credible. So I, I have read the, read the paper and it's, it's good. Well, this is what we try to do. I mean, uh, if we get to the, after 24 months, we cannot speak only in terms of slogans or the grandiose words that we put into declarations. Credible strategy means that we can describe it in percentages, euros, meters, months, uh, and uh, well, US dollars if needed. Uh, and the main message again, it's doable, affordable, it's within the reach. Uh, and I think uh, there are very little people living uh, under the sort of transatlantic sun that uh, wouldn't be in position to commit into that. Okay, let's take out the crystal ball. I'll let you yeah, make a prediction I, I, yeah. <laughs> for the for the next ten years. So what's what do you think Putin is planning to do next ten years? What's going to happen? I mean, if this plan is not uh, being utilized, what's going to happen? And, uh, that's a very good question, especially here in Munich today. Um, uh, 17 years ago, he uh, made his famous speech when he uh, pled for going back to the balance of power that was seized with the, with the collapse of the Soviet Union. At the end of 2021, he reiterated this <clears throat> well, the message of that speech, but it, this came in the form of ultimatum. So we have no sort of hesitation and thinking that he's committed into this vision that he has in his sick head. Uh, in the meantime, he has conducted the war against Georgia in 2008. He first attacked Ukraine, and then this, I mean, attacks were ongoing uh, well throughout the eight years, and you can see it in the War of Remembrance in Kiev. I mean, every single week there, there was someone who got killed in Ukraine. Um, in the meantime, he also attacked in Syria. 
and now he's um, is executing this in full scale in Ukraine. So he will not stop before he will be stopped. And and I think that is something that we shouldn't be convincing anyone anymore. But is Europe committed to Ukraine right now? I think Europe is is very much committed. Uh, and if I look at the, the prime ministers and, and presidents of Europe, then the problem attribution is clearly there. Everyone understands what's at stake. Well, that's the good thing. But of course, I mean, it would be delusional to speak like that if, if there is still war ongoing and, and there are you know, very few objective parameters where Ukraine is winning. So clearly we need to do more. Clearly we need to do more. There is, there is no question. We need no more money. We need more uh, ammunition. We need to uh, invest more in European defense industry. Um, and uh, we need to make sure that uh, this sort of political commitment will become clear for every single government. And it, it's not only the job of you that you are doing so marvelously, and not, not only the job for you know, guys like me, it's also the regular people you know, walking down the street um, who believe in that cause. And how they execute their will is that they should vote for people who promise to do exactly like that. How can we, in Europe, ensure that our support to Ukraine is sustainable, long-term, and it has some actual lasting impact. Well, it's fairly, again, we're fairly easy to say at least. Uh, we need to invest more money into defense. We need to ramp up our uh, defense industry, and we also need to make sure that our own defenses are, are on a very credible level. And, um, and actually, if we look into the figures again, I mean, it's not that imaginary or just throwing out promises. Uh, in the last four years, Europe has actually done it twice. You know what the answer of European Union for COVID was? In the monetary, how many euros did the European Union put up? No idea. It was 740 billion. Billion. This is with um, that, that number that is a thousand times larger than a million. Mm. Um, you know what the combined European answer was? The energy crisis or so-called spike energy prices was when the war was all already ongoing at the end of 2022. How much did the European government the governments put forward as a subsidies. Maybe something same amount or... Yeah, around 800 billion. So um, <clears throat> now if we look at the figures on just pure military aid, uh, the European nations have also individually done and there has been some other aids, but this, just the pure military aid of European Union has been 5 billion. So compared to 750 billion, 150 times different. Compared to 800 billion, 160 times different. Okay, we can argue, COVID was also a pretty big problem. A lot of people died and all that. But the strategic magnitude is not 150 times. It's in the same category. Uh, but my point is that Europe is facilitated, fit, prepared to do the same thing. The money is there and uh, um, we should take the responsibility and, and end this madness and make sure that uh, not only Ukraine but the, also Europe will end up as a beacon of light and beacon of hope for, uh, for all the nations who want to belong to Europe and, uh, and, um, and self-fulfill themselves in Europe. And I think there is probably no better nation to speak about this than Estonia. We started literally from the scratch and when we regained our independence uh, in early 90s. Our GDP has, has grown 40, 40 times in 30 years. We have become with the education system, like in Finland, that is in the top three around the world. We are the, you know, the fairy tale land for startups and all that. I mean, this is all what also waits for, for Ukraine. This is the promise. When you commit to freedom, when you commit to democracy, when you commit to self-fulfillment, when you commit to rule of law, when you commit to uh, zero tolerance for corruption and all that. And, and I think that is what we are all actually standing for in Ukraine. This is what they're actually fighting for. And this is what actually at stake. If we let these, Ukraine, uh, these Russian murderers to win, then we send them the message that all this freedom, blah, 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 is not worth anything for us, but it actually is. And then we need to make sure that we stand behind our words. Uh, but are European countries effectively coordinating with each other uh, to maximize the impact? And when it comes to support in Ukraine 
And if they're not, how, can, how could we achieve this? Well, I, I think when it comes to coordination, then there is a lot of coordination ongoing. There are, I think there are a lot of defense officials who see their colleagues more often than they see their families in the last two years. Uh, but again, the coordination is that issue. I mean, there's, I don't know anyone who would think that, that we need another working group somewhere, or that the working group for lack of coordination is the problem. The problem is that we are not putting enough money on the table, we are not manufacturing enough ammunition, and we are not you know, doing enough. That's the problem. And um, the coordination is just a sort of little, little part of that, microscopic part of that solution. Uh, the end solution is, you know, putting more money, putting more weapons, putting more willingness, and sending this mes message to Russia that uh, he will eventually lose. And they will end up in poverty, they, they end up in jail, they end up in ruins. This is what, what needs to go out from us. And, and I think that, that we are not there. And it might be even be the opposite, that, uh, that Russia is believing, Putin is believing that they are sending this message to us. And we need to overturn this. I mean, that's the whole sort of strategic job for us. We need to make himself believe that uh, he will eventually lose. And I mean, if we again look at the numbers, this paper is about numbers. <clears throat> We are, I mean, extremely well positioned to do that. We are, as a Ramstein coalition, we're 30 times more richer. 30 times. Defense expenditure, the combined defense expenditure is 13 times bigger in Ramstein coalition. And actually, if we look in the zoom in into the military aid and, and the amounts that Russians are spending to military, then roughly Russians spend around 11 billion a month for you know, sustaining the warfare in Ukraine. Uh, the, the aid that Ramstein Coalition is putting forward is around 5 billion, so it's 50% of that. So clearly, I mean, how come we cannot be Russian? I mean, it's impossible. And then all the parameters like access to talent, access to capital, access to technologies, all that, I mean, we are off the chart uh, com compared to them. So we should be equipped for, for doing that. Question, how do we actually get there? But given the internal frictions inside the EU, I'm not going to name any countries, but for example, when it comes to buying ammunition outside of EU, there are some countries that are basically objecting this. What can be done to make aid to reach Ukraine more quickly? Is there too much bureaucracy and too much objection inside the EU for, for this, in your view? Yeah. Well, it has been a long road this last 20 24 months and uh, since the very beginning we have uh, chosen this strategy to uh, not to put our allies to the spot or not to sort of criticize them especially in the back uh, back view mirror our job is to uh, live by example encourage show the positive case uh, put numbers behind the promise that it actually can be done and, and and I think that is the job if this job would be easy then it would have been done already then you would have no one to watch your watch your <laughs> channel because it would all be solved. I mean, we should wouldn't need to have this Munich conference here or, or nothing. Um, well, clearly it's not as easy. What matters is how how we will be better a year from now than uh, than than how uh, how we were a year ago. And this was the attitude why our prime minister started this one million round initiative uh, around uh, the same time last year because we saw that the stocks will be empty by that time. Okay, we, we might argue here that this, I mean, the promise has not, you know, fully delivered and all that, but uh, half is there and the other half will be there by the end of the year. And the alternative would have been that there would have been nothing. So now our job is to get to the position that by the 24, Ukrainians would have the fire superiority. For that, they need 200,000 and we are on track of, of getting there. Of course, we need more commitment. Of course, we need each and every president and prime minister to go to their government saying that, hey, this is the moment where we also, where we also need to make some decisions at the expense of, at the expense of, of some domestic requirements. And uh, this is where the true leadership is being revealed. The true leaders never appear when you only need to step on a pedestal and, and uh, give a sort of con congratulatory speech. Uh, the true leadership uh, is uh, only revealed when you're alone in your room and it's dark, everyone is uh, against you. 
And this is where you need to start tough decisions. And this is, I think, we are getting to that moment. Um, but as in every uh, sphere of livelihood, before things start to get better, they really need to get very dark. Um, and I think we are, we are approaching that, that um, time of, of this war. So let's, let's try some <coughs> yeah. optimism. Uh, looking ahead, yeah. after Ukraine has won the war, um, how do you see Ukraine's role uh, in the EU in the future? Well, there is, has been a lot of talks about the accession of the EU and NATO and the process and paperwork and all that. And clearly, it's a cumbersome process for even for Estonia. It took years to get through this procedure. But the main message or the main promise about this is very, very simple. This nation is fighting for their freedom. They are fighting for a self-fulfillment right to belong whatever alliance they want to. And then there is this murderous regime who says that, no, you can't, because we, we think that you should live like us in poverty and, and all that. So if they are fighting for that in this security realm where we all live, then the least we can do, and this is the least we can do, we need to send them the message that you are welcome. You belong to the family of European NATO nations. Uh, that live, live in the same atmosphere, atmospheres, they breathe the same air, and also you know, believe in the same values. That's the basic, simplest promise that uh, they just plainly deserve. And, and uh, this is what uh, they have been handed over. And uh, now I think uh, it's our common duty to fulfill that. But of course, before that, we need to make sure that Russians are being kicked out of that country and they win the war. Okay, let's hop on to the other side of the Atlantic for a while. Uh, what would the re-election of Donald Trump mean for Ukraine, Europe and NATO in general? Well, I realize that's a sort of hot topic and uh, it's a really good click bite. Uh, but the truth is that uh, the um, European and American relations are well cemented over the last 100 years. And if, again, we are a number of people in Estonia... If we look at that, then I don't think that there is anything that would hamper this because it's just uh, mutually beneficial. We're based on the same values, but also economic figures. And let me, let me give you a few. Uh, Europe is actually the, the biggest export market of, of the U.S. So U.S. has 51 states, 50 states. And in 45 of those, Europe is the biggest export partner, like by, by far the biggest Uh, 65% of the foreign direct investments that go to U.S. So all the factories and all other stuff that the uh, the foreign companies build come from Europe. 65%, so two thirds, and in total numbers, it's 3.4 trillion, not million, not billion, but trillion. A trillion is thousand billion. The European companies in U.S. Um, hire five million people. The, the profits that uh, U.S. companies earn from Europe are by far the biggest. It's actually almost three times higher than they are from Asia. And the total number that the American companies earn from European customers is... You th how much do you think it is? You'll have to yeah, it's uh, 325 billion. It's, it's more than all the European nations spend on defense. Uh, so it's a, it's, a, it's a lot of money. And also, when we come to the, uh, the national resources, like the liqui liquefied the national natural gas, then the Europe is the biggest market for U.S. So, I mean, what it does, it illustrates that uh, it's in Europe's interest, but it's also in, European, uh, in U.S. interest, and that our ties would be strong, interlinked, and we would uh, fight for the same values. And of course, when it comes to uh, defense expenditure, then I don't think that there is anyone who would disagree with President Trump that everyone needs to commit to 2%. And it's, it's not, not a new one. I mean, every single heads of state and government committed to 2% already in 2014. So 10 years ago, every single government in Europe said that they will spend 2%. And there are some who hasn't. I mean, how can it be? Of course, they need to put, uh, put up 2%. There is no question about that. 
But I think most countries that are bordering, have to share border with Russia, have reached or are about to reach this 10%. Yeah. So regardless of what Trump says, there's a very strong connection between the U.S. and Europe, <coughs> uh, as we see from the numbers. Uh, well, that is true. I mean, Estonia, for example, we put up uh, 3.2 already. But uh, I think also, and this is where uh, we, we need to also do a better job as, as the European Union, also as NATO, well, apparently only the Russian threat is not enough to do the job. I mean, it, I mean, it isn't. I mean, there are still more than 10 members who is putting up. So we need to be cleverer we in also in our policy making. And the way we approach it, and this is also what our prime minister is, uh, uh, is advocating for, we need to be better in uh, defense industrial investments. So if we think of defense investment, then we shouldn't only think about threat. We also need to think about opportunity. We also need to be need to think about something that appeals to politicians and voters. And I mean, these are simple things: jobs, growth, investments, technology. And this is something that all the defense in industri industry is about. So we need to invest more to that area, and this will come sort of uh, self spiraling growth. Growth that gives birth to new growth, new ideas, new spillover technologies. And I mean, we all know the effects of the uh, uh, Cold War time defense expenditure, how it uh, gave birth to internet and all the other beautiful stuff, GPS and everything. If there would have been no Cold War, then we wouldn't be driving Ubers because there wouldn't be no GPS. We would, I mean, wouldn't, I don't know. If we didn't have internet, then where would we live then? <laughs> Better world. <laughs> Uh, well, anyway, um, Article 5, it's been invoked only once, done by the U.S. after 9-11. Yeah. Uh, do you still think it's a credible uh, deterrence for Russia? So, for example, if you say Russia decides to annex northern Finland, parts from northern Finland or from Estonia, do you feel like NATO allies would be willing to... Uh, come defend if, if uh, Estonia or Finland, for example, invoked Article 5? Okay, that's a good question. Well, I want to be ex extra clear here. We think that it's 100% credible. Uh, it's credible um, it, because it has functioned for 70 years and it has been the guarantee for the peace and security in Europe throughout the world's history, history of mankind. Um, and it's not only about the, these two sentences in this paragraph. It's about what this paragraph actually guards. And this is the same values, the same economic prosperity, the same self-fulfillment right for all the people here. And this is why this is the beacon of hope for everyone, why everyone sort of aspires to immigrate to Europe. I mean, somehow they are not immigrating to Russia, all these people. Uh, somehow they want to live in the U.S. Uh, they, they're not emigrating to Mexico or somewhere. So this is the promise that is guarding. This is the promise that is only not only standing in in Europe, but it's always standing in the other areas that are depending on on the U.S. security promises, and and, and of course it's it's credible. But at the same time, we also need to be clear that it's um, it's it's not these two sentences that that are Russia or it's piece of paper. It's the military credibility. And now on this Finnish and Estonian question. Uh, there has been a lot of years thrown out and a lot of numbers, three years, five years, well, whatever. Well, it's not a binary question, you know, it's war comes, war won't come. It's the risk perception or risk sort of calculation question. Um, well, we spoke about COVID before. Well, I think people still remember there was this issue with some people don't want to vaccinate themselves. Well, the risk scenario against that was one out of four million. So the risk of dying from uh, the vaccination inject was one from four million. Well, we all know some people who don't want to fly airplanes because they are afraid of planes crashing. Well, one out of 10 million planes will crash. So this is the risk calculation that hundreds of millions of people are afraid of. So if we speak now about the potential threat scenarios uh, well, coming out of Russia when they should win the war, then we are not in the categories of one of millions. We are in the categories of rolling a dice or, or um, flipping a coin, basically. And this is something that is extremely uncomfortable. And this is something that we 
and we need to seriously tackle with. And this is what we are doing. Estonia is doing that, the Baltic states are doing, Poland is doing that, Finland is doing that. And the whole purpose of that is not going to war. The only purpose of that is to avert the war. To send the message to Russia that whatever you think in your sick head, whatever you think that you will gain, your losses will be infinitely higher. And you will materialize these losses not in you know, one month, 24 months, but you will materialize instantly. From the first second, from the first um, centimeter, you will lose. And, and we have um, the trade soldiers, units, weapons, stocks, and most importantly, the willingness and resolve of the people uh, to fulfill that promise. And if we get this message across, then, well, they, then they won't come. I mean, there's, at the end of the day, there are still rational people. Going back to the one in 10 million, so it was actually a very low chance that Precozin's plane would go down, so one in yeah. 10 million. Um, but going back to the front lines, there's still plenty of armored vehicles rust, rust, rusting in warehouses around Europe and the US. Uh, what is the significance of these, these vehicles for Ukraine with, in this war? Okay, that's uh, another very good question now. Well, the significance is, I think, in the word rusting in European warehouses. And the message it sends is that Europe is not prepared. Europe wasn't prepared. And uh, we need to do fast. We need to move faster. <clears throat> well, I, I work in defense, and you have been covering this for years. You know what it means. If you're that, and you're from Finland, if you've got a rusting tanks or armor personnel carriers in your warehouses, well, then they, they don't work. If you don't have stocks for ammunition, well, you know what it means. But for like everyday viewers, maybe they don't grasp the seriousness of that. If we speak about the um, uh, lack of ammunition or the low defense readiness and all that, then the actual normal people talk. It means that you are not able to defend your country. Well, that's what it means. And, of course, when you articulate like that, then this is something that you know, makes you feel extremely uncomfortable, especially in, if you are in the position of prime minister or defense minister or something. So you need to do something about that. And I think we are now getting to this position when this problem attribution is there. Uh, the threat is being all revealed once again. And, and this message is getting back. I mean, it's ridiculous. It's almost criminal that you have rusting... Uh, defense vehicles in your warehouses that first you're not in position to send to Ukraine but secondly you cannot even use them for the purpose, the sole purpose that you bought them. So it's irresponsible and, and uh, this needs to be fixed and this needs to be fixed in a very very fast order. But there's argumentation against like armored vehicles because uh, drone warfare you can, you can use a $500 drone to destroy I don't know, 3 million Dollar tank mm -hmm. or or so, uh, I mean, how has this drone warfare changed the way war, modern war is waged? Uh, again, I think the truth will be eventually revealed in um, in the history books. But I, I think the change is already there. The change is there in in terms of technological new realms, uh, like we are able to uh, provide precision range and lethality of some weapons much faster and better and, and with a much lower cost footprint than we were able to do before. Uh, what this has created, this has created sort of new industries. This has brought some civilian technologies to defense that were never used there. And of course, if the scale goes up, and this is something that has happened with drones, in 2022, maybe we spoke about tens of thousands of drones. In last year, 23, we spoke about hundreds of thousands a month already. And then this year, uh, we are speaking about uh, 300 thousands a month already. And what that means, it means that the economies of scale are coming in. And what, when the economies of scale are starting to materialize, then the prices go down. They manufacture more components. If you manufacture more, the prices will go down. Uh, and this is all what's happening. Uh, then there is, uh, of course, more money, more attention to to invest all these new guidance systems and, and new terminal sort of targeting elements 
that make it um, make it all cheaper and definitely this will be something that will tailor the future warfare and this is where also Estonia where we want to make decisive steps uh, to make sure that we will grasp and take advantage of this sort of technological uh, breakthrough but at the same time I also think that uh, we, we need to curb some enthusiasm here uh, well the reason in the first place what, why all these FPV drones and all were taken into inventories was because Ukrainians were running out of ammunition and they wanted to compensate the mortar and artillery ammunition with FPVs um, and the message that this sentence carries is that artillery is still important and why it's important because with artillery you can carry you know 30 kilos of explosive to up to 40 kilometers with a pretty good accuracy. And when you put the same requirement to a drone, then you are not doing this for $500 anymore. This goes to tens of thousands, and this will be, um, and this is where artillery is still cheaper. So artillery, artillery, artillery is still something that we need to stick to when uh, we want Ukraine to win the war. Okay, still uh, on the topic of drones, Ukraine has recently started launching attacks against targets deep in Russia, like oil refineries. Uh, <coughs> do you think that this can, is it, is it, does it have a real effect? I believe it does. I believe Russian, uh, the Ukrainians are very clever, courageous in doing that. Well, <coughs> Russia does it all the time. It does it for Ukraine with, with all the exports and, and wheat and all that, but he does it with destroying their economy every single day. At the point of that, to, again, to implant the idea that we will destroy and demolish you every day that you will give up eventually. And this is, has been the fight where that Ukraine has been fighting with you know, one hand uh, tied behind, behind their back. Uh, they need to start to do the same thing. And why? Not because Russians are doing it. Because we Ukrainians and also we as a West, we need to send them the message that you will end up in ruins. You will end up in poverty. You will end up with nothing if you can continue that effort. And this is the whole idea of sanctions and all that. And also with sanctions, I mean, we need to do a better job, apparently, if we still find Western ships, uh, Western components in Russian newly minted, newly manufactured missiles. That's ridiculous. This needs to be stopped. And then this, again, is, uh, is our duty to end. Can Ukraine recapture the 1991 borders, uh, Crimea included, in the next 10 years? Uh, they can, and they can do it much, much faster. That's a simple answer. How, how fast? Let's, well, let's let's type it up. Again, yeah. again, uh, <laughs> the, we have come up with a strategy. We, we, we put up the link to this paper if it's oh, yeah, great. Right. to the let's, description. Let's do that. So in order to find the answer, I encourage you to read this booklet. <laughs> um, and, and Becca, thank you very much for, for the invite, and thank you very much for the conversation. And most importantly, thank you for the, all the great job that you have been doing in, in this podcast and in, in your Watnik Chup uh, Soup uh, channel. Uh, thank you. This is our pleasure. It's been really great. Thank you.